Few would argue with the value of a law that has secured convictions in some of the most notorious murder cases of recent years. Almost 19 years after Stephen Lawrence was stabbed to death in South London, two men have finally been jailed for his murder. Gary Dobson and David Norris were both found guilty, although there was no proof that either had delivered the fatal blow. The law that convicted them was joint enterprise, which holds that a person in a group or gang can be held responsible for the criminal acts of others. Kids need to know today that if they're going to get involved in gangs and gang crime, then they can be found as much guilty for being there as actually committing the crime. Rising incidents of gun and knife crime have put pressure on successive governments to take tough action on gangs. Where there is a need for new laws, we will pass them. Where there is a need for tougher enforcement, we will make sure that that happens. For too long, there's been a lack of focus on the complete lack of respect shown by these groups of thugs. Joint Enterprise, a 300-year-old law, has proved a highly effective weapon in this fight. But there is a growing unease within the legal profession that it's being too widely applied. There's a very clear public policy that the gang violence problem is a serious one, and it is. Politicians are quite right. They have to deal with public concerns, and so does the law. What we don't know is whether the cost of doing that is people are being convicted of things that they haven't done. What time do you like to do? We'll be on till late this afternoon. It's that really hard, isn't it? Because he keeps saying, what do you think of? And not getting too optimistic. But yeah. I don't want him to get really down to find guilty. Sally Hulsall, her husband Jeff and daughter Charlotte are a family struggling to deal with the news that Sally's son Alex has been involved in a serious crime. Detectives are continuing to search for the killers of a 22-year-old man stabbed to death in a busy shopping area of West London. It was a Friday night and we got a call from a police station to say that they had my son and he wanted to talk to me and he was very, very distressed, so the most distressed I've ever heard him and he told me that he had been arrested for murder. Alex Henry had been involved in a street fight in which one of his friends had used a concealed knife to stab two brothers, killing 21-year-old Taki Kaziki. Following his arrest, Alex Henry was charged with joint enterprise murder, along with three other boys. Did you know about joint enterprise? I knew that there was a law where a group of people, one of them may commit the crime, but the others are egging them on, and, and they knew he was going to do it, and they supported him and encouraged him to do it, then that is joint enterprise. And, and I agree with that law. If my son was murdered, I would want the murderer to be charged and to be sentenced for murder. If the group of people that were with him had planned it and intended on doing it with him, then I would agree with that law. But I would not want people in that situation, on the peripheral of that situation, or involved where was a, both groups are fighting, and they, you know, I would want each and every boy to be charged with what they did. The use of joint enterprise raises the question, how far should a person be held responsible for the unexpected actions of others? In August 2011, Wayne Collins, a 24-year-old barber from Luton, was about to fall foul of the law. He was in Birmingham for carnival when the riots broke out. Let me explain to you about that night. The CCTV footage shows my nephew didn't hurt anybody, he didn't pick anything up, he didn't throw anything. All he was was there. 
What CCTV footage also showed, however, was that Collins was in the crowd when a hooded figure produced a gun and fired it towards the police. Later that night, he was arrested and charged with possession of a firearm. Officer, yeah. are they trying to say that oh, I had a firearm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From where though? We know he's going to talk to you about it, mate. So, so if you've got any questions, ask them in your own mind. Yeah? Okay. You do something wrong, yes, you should be punished for it. My nephew did nothing. He knew one person who happened to be related to another person whether or not they were doing something, I don't know. But why should you be punished for their actions? The case against Wayne Collins was that while he was in Birmingham, he'd met up with Jermaine Lewis, whose cousin, Nicholas Francis, was later convicted of using the firearm that night. The police claimed that this association meant he must have known about the gun and foresaw how it was going to be used. A gun? The fact that he may have known, speculative, because this other guy's got a gun, he must have known he had it, well, that's nothing to base that on. Must have known he was going to shoot it at police rather than in the air, there's no, no evidence of, of, of that. It's, it's all complete speculation, um, but, but that's the way the joint enterprise works. How can you prove that someone knowingly knows what somebody else is thinking? What's your occupation? Well, Barbara. His problem was that he was not good at giving his account. He was completely out of his depth. He was in Birmingham with people he didn't know. They were all members of serious gangs. So when Wayne was arrested, I think he was frightened of saying things, and he gave a story which wasn't true to the police. What are you doing up here, then? Meeting a girl. Uh, then... uh, one o'clock in the morning? Well, obviously, well, the guys smashed out the girls' windows, and then they're chasing me down the road. What do you want me to do? The girls drove off and left me. What do you want me to do? because he would have had to name the people he was with. That would have linked them with him, and he was actually found at the scene, and, 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 and they weren't. And on that basis, he wasn't believed, and he was convicted. Although there was no evidence that Collins had seen or touched the gun, he was found guilty of possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life, and sent to prison for 18 years. 18 years is excessively long for somebody who has not participated and it's based purely on inference and speculation as to what Wayne may have known. Concerns about joint enterprise are echoed at the highest level of the legal establishment and have led one recently retired senior judge to take the unusual step of publicly criticising the way the law is being used. Let's take a murder case. A person can't normally be convicted of murder unless he intended to kill or intended to cause serious, very serious bodily harm. But in joint enterprise, instead of having to intend to kill someone, it's enough if he foresaw that someone might be killed. But it's a very low threshold. You can think of many situations in your life where you foresee that something might happen, but you certainly don't intend it to happen in any way at all. Whatever their misgivings, judges are obliged by law to impose life sentences on anyone convicted of joint enterprise murder. Alex Henry has been on remand for five months and is discovering how difficult it is to fight a charge under joint enterprise. He was speaking to the solicitor and the solicitor was like, joint enterprise murder is 25 years. And he was just like, but, but how? I don't, I didn't know there was a knife. But, so, and he, he went, yeah, I know, but they're gonna, they're gonna try and prove that you knew that there was a knife. And he was like, but how do they know what I'm thinking? How, like, how am I looking now at 25 years for shopping with someone that may or may not have had a knife? We spoke to the barristers yesterday and they were really, really helpful. And what was their perspective on the case as it stands at the moment? We asked them that. We said roughly, what, what do you think? And they said 50-50. I mean, when I came out of that meeting, I thought, things are getting worse. I had a secret hope that they, we'd go in there and they'd say, listen, you know, he's clearly innocent. The jury will know he's innocent. Um, he probably won't even get um, anything. The person that did commit the murder, I believe, um, will be denying it. Um, so without any independent witnesses seeing a knife, 
none of the boys that didn't do it seeing a knife, who's, who's to know who actually had this knife, who's to know who committed it. So I think that's our first task of, get, mm. of, uh, um, of them finding out. Who well, did it? Well, we know who done it, but yeah. the jury seeing yeah. who done it. And then second to that, proving that the other three co-defendants didn't know about the knife. The effectiveness of joint enterprise in securing multiple convictions for a single crime was demonstrated following the murder of Ben Kinsella in 2008. This CCTV shows the events immediately before Ben's death. His acquaintances are being chased up an Islington street by the defendants. Three men were charged with the killing, and although it was never proved which one of them stabbed Ben, using joint enterprise they were all found guilty of murder. All three of them knew what they were doing. They came armed with knives. Um, he was stabbed in, within five, five seconds. He was stabbed 11 times. So, yeah, I hold them all responsible. Not one of them tried to stop the other two from doing it. Not one of them assisted my son while he was bleeding on the floor. There was none of that. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're, they're all culpable for it. Without joint enterprise, probably maybe one or even two of them would still be walking the streets today. The public demonstration which followed Ben's death reflected wide support for the principle that all those involved in a murder, however peripherally, should be held to account. If a gang of kids or men or whatever want to go out and commit these sort of crimes, then they've got to know that if they are part of it or involved in it, then they're going to be held responsible. In 2010, 16-year-old Nicholas Pearton was stabbed to death in a South London street. Police need to stop this. Do you know what I mean? Before all of our children die, you know, parents aren't meant to bury their children, you know, and to see the state of his mother last night, well, she was just literally uncontrollable. Nine teenagers were eventually charged with his murder. The prosecuting counsel was Edward Brown. There was a dreadful killing in May 2010 a young boy was chased across a park, across a road, stabbed in the middle of the road by one person. He received a stab wound to his back. It proved fatal within seconds. The trigger for the murder was a schoolgate confrontation between two boys from the Grove Park area and two boys from nearby Sydenham. Nothing serious happened. No blows were exchanged and uh, the boys from Grove Park went back home to the various homes and a plan was said to be hatched to travel to the Sydenham area and mark this disrespect um, by finding and probably chasing the Sydenham boys and showing them that uh, they can't get away with just doing this at the school gates. The group from Grove Park travelled by bus and met the Sydenham boys in a park on their home turf. The Sydenham gang ran away, only to return a few minutes later, brandishing weapons. There was a brief standoff, and no blows were exchanged, but as it finished, Nicholas Pearton found himself isolated from his friends. He was chased out of the park and into Sydenham Road, where he was stabbed once in the back. He died in the doorway of a shop protecting himself from another person who was seeking to attack him further. The case was heard at the Old Bailey in January 2011. Although only one boy had stabbed Nicholas Pearton, nine were charged with his murder. Joint enterprise, it's called. It's not a statutory definition. It's an ordinary expression. The public, I suspect, would approve of a secondary party, not the stabber or the shooter, but the secondary party being convicted of a serious crime if they were participating by, for example, encouraging the gunman or the knife man. 
Of the boys charged with murder, only three were in the street at the time of the stabbing. The rest were scattered over the area where the fight had taken place. One of them, 15-year-old Joseph J, claimed to be at the other end of the park. I've described the law of the Trident Enterprise as a drift net. You, you drop your drift net into the ocean and you pull out all sorts of fish, big and small, and you hope that someone's going to chuck the small fish back in before it's too late, but you can never be sure that that's going to happen. Alex Henry's family have been given CCTV footage by his lawyers, showing the lead up to the fight. They're viewing it for the first time. Okay, so that's the, so they're going to the, the confrontation car. happening down there. So there's four now, and now they've. He's trying to split it up. Trying to pull them away. Yeah, he's trying to say, "Don't argue." That's very, very clear that he's trying to stop them from fighting. Yeah. One of them, and that's one of the friends of my son. The boy doing his best to break up the fight is Yunus Tahib. He's one of the four on remand for the murder. Oh, gosh, he is trying hard, isn't he? Mm. The boy behind Yunus, carrying the bottle, is another of Alex's co-defendants, Janelle Grant Murray. OK, so now they're coming around the corner. My son isn't here in this at all. They go over the road there, I think. Alex, who had been shopping with his friend Cameron Ferguson, runs into the altercation when he sees Eunice and Janelle on the other side of the road. You can see them. There. There. there they are. They're running there now because they're running really fast because they've seen their friends. The fight, which lasts less than 45 seconds, takes place in an area not covered by CCTV cameras. The first boy to leave the fight yeah. is carrying what later proved to be the fatal weapon. There he is. Stop. There. there. Now, see? This is the bag here. And it's sticking out. And it's an sticking angle. out. So it's got a heavy, heavy object A plastic in it. bag doesn't stick out like that unless it's got something in it that is long. The running boy who confessed later that day to the other three that he'd used a concealed knife in the fight is the 19-year-old Cameron Ferguson. Do you feel that there's been enough emphasis on finding which of the four were actually responsible for, for stabbing the victim? No, I think they just want to put them all in the frame. They're all there. They know one of the four did it, and as they are allowed to under joint enterprise, they can just scoop them all up in one go. They don't have to find out, really, who out of the four did it. Uh, makes their job easier, really, doesn't it? Mm. Two years after his conviction for possession of a firearm, Wayne Collins' appeal is being heard at the Royal Courts of Justice. Well, we appealed against the conviction, but it's very difficult to appeal against conviction because you have to show there was some error in the judge's um, summing up. It must be an error of law. On the 18 years, our case was this is just disproportionate for somebody who's described as playing no active role in, in, in the events. Deborah Taylor, Wayne's aunt, has been fronting the family's campaign for his release. I've come out here today at the Royal Courts of Justice a lot more confident in the justice system than what I felt two and a half years ago on, on the trial. There is a way that, you know, with persevering and, and campaigning, we can get this sentence reduced. That's great. That's done. That's all I need from you. It went really well. James dusted them. James said the judge misled them. How we delivered it, Mum, was amazing. 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 Is the family hopeful? We are, yeah. We are. Reduction in sentence, you know, definitely. So, yeah, it's good. I'm happy. There's hope. And, and you know, at the end of the day, thank God there's an appeal court. Wayne Collins' family will now have to wait until the ruling is handed down by the judges. It's a picture of my daughter and my brother. It was taken about nine months ago in jail. As you can see, she loves him a lot, and he looks completely different to his mugshot. 
we just thought tops they were holding three days and he'll come home and we'll go through it together till we get to court but when we just as the days went on the weeks the months we started thinking what's going on and then we realized that he was probably going to get an example made of him yeah. but didn't think it was going to be 18 years. He's involved in everybody in our family, in our lives. So somebody being taken away for 18 years in a very small involvement of a crime. I don't see the justice in that as his father. The main thing that comes to mind is Alex is very kind and sweet. Um, he's the only one really out of all my family that can tell if I'm upset just at a glance. Like he'll just come in and I'll just looking away and he'll be like, what's happened, what's happened, are you okay? He's very protective of like his family and um, especially me and my mum. Um, he's really smart as well. When we was younger, he's really, really good at maths. Uh, he flourished at school. The teachers told me he was outstanding. But then he developed what they classified him as having ADHD and he couldn't sit still in the classroom. They perceived that to be aggression and bad behaviour when actually it's a child who needs to be reassured and needs a safe environment. He was expelled when he was 11. When you're kicked out of school you're sent to these alternative provisions. No child that likes education is actually going to want to go to one of these things because it's, it's not really teaching, it's just a place for them to be off the street. I did feel like I, w I was losing him. I was losing him to his friends and I didn't know who they were. He seemed to have a whole world that he was involved in when I was at work and he wasn't at school. Um, and this is, it was an incredibly difficult, impossible situation. I've read books and, and articles and no one ever talks about it because people are ashamed. They're ashamed to say that I lost control of, of my child. <laughs> Seven months after his arrest, Alex Henry's trial has started at the Old Bailey. All four co-defendants are pleading not guilty to charges of murder and attempted murder. The prosecution case is that each of them played a part in a joint attack on Taki Kaziki and his brother. Each knew about a knife and intended it would be used to stab. On the fifth day of the trial, there is a dramatic development. The judge called all the boys back in and asked Cameron Ferguson his plea, um, again for both counts of murder and GBH with intent, and he pleaded guilty to both counts. We're, we're very pleased that the person who did it has been honest enough and courageous enough um, without any family around him to support him, to hold up his hands and say that it was him. It gives the, all of the families peace of mind to know that that knowledge is out there now. So that's really positive, however, we're still proceeding with the trial because they're still trying to get the three other boys in on the murder as well. Um, they're going to seek to prove that they knew about the knife. We know that that can't be proven, but <laughs> they're going to seek to prove it nonetheless, and we just got to pray that the jury see the truth. Despite the change of plea, Alex's family are concerned that the jury will not be impressed by his behaviour immediately after the fight. He knew the police were looking for him, but wanted to avoid arrest for three days so he could attend his pregnant girlfriend's first scan. And even though by this time Cameron had told him he'd used a knife, the two of them went to hide out in a friend's flat in Croydon. He got to Croydon and um, news reports start coming in and he eventually realises there's been a fatality. Alex calls me and he says, look, Charlotte, my girlfriend's pregnant. You need to pick me up and you need to take me and her to the scan. And I'm, I'm very excited. I'm just, I've, I was lost at the word pregnant. I'm like, what's mum gonna say? I'm so excited and all of that. And he goes, no, no, Charlotte, you must listen to the rest, rest I've got to tell you. Something really bad has happened. I can't tell you what it is because I don't want you to get in trouble but you need to pick me up, you need to take me to the scan, and then you need to take me to the, to the solicitors and then take me to the police station. So I plan to pick him up on the Friday, uh, but unfortunately on the Thursday night, Alex is arrested. 
For every family that sees joint enterprise as a threat to the liberty of their loved ones, there are others who believe it was their only way of securing justice. That's Uma. Uses noodle sticks to eat my noodles with. It's these pencils. And if we have nothing, we eat with bare hands. And I'm not gonna lie. I do have bare hands. It's all and I hear glass breaks. Then I find a false way to pass great. Uma Tufail was forging a music career when he was murdered in a drive-by shooting in 2012. <laughs> It's one of them. See, he's so full of life. Yeah, I know he was, wasn't he? Fun. Oh. He was. Do you know, sometimes I do believe in the death penalty because they took more than just his life, they destroyed Sarge's, you know, his families, any his girlfriends, any chance of ever having kids. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult. Our lives will never be the same again. Umar was sitting in his car outside his home here in Thornton Heath when Daly and Thomas drove up alongside him. They pulled out a gun and shot him once at point-blank range. There was one shooter, um, but there were two people involved from the offset. There was a lot of CCTV footage of, of the two lads together. The accomplice was in the car. He saw the shooter take out the gun and he admittedly said that when the person who shot my son pulled out the gun, he leaned back. To, to make room for him to carry out his horrendous crime. In my mind, I knew that they both were equally responsible. So I think, you know, having joined Enterprise really does give you that peace of mind. Although, you know, I'd never be happy that my son's gone, but at least we managed to convict both people who, who, who were guilty of the, of the crime that they committed. Since the death of Umar, Sarge has been on a mission to warn young people about the dangers of gang crime. The shooter got 25 years, the accomplice 22, uh, without any parole. These are two young men who had a life ahead of themselves. Um, not only have they taken my son's life, but they've also destroyed theirs. So joint enterprise it is there for a purpose, and it's there for a purpose when people are involved from the offset. Thanks for listening. Is there a way to honestly prove to a court that you did not know if your friend was going to commit a crime? You, no, you know that you didn't know but you might not be able to prove it, and that's the problem. That's why people actually get sentenced because they can't prove it. They don't it's want to about, say It's a circumstance, it's the way the thing was set in it. You live in Loughborough, I mm. live in Loughborough. Mm. They ain't gonna believe us. You, you're from Loughborough, mm. I went to the same school as David Cameron, and I grew up with him, and I'm in a car with you, mm. and I didn't know, they believe it. Now that it's the circumstances, what you, what, what, it's where you come from at the end of the day. It's a fact, even, yeah. even in your situation, you get me? The, the sad thing is that guy that was in the car, what's he going to do? Sit in the passenger side and keep his head there. Mine was on a fire. You're going to move back anyway. If you're in the car with me and I pull out a gun and go to shoot someone, you're going to move out the way. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is, someone has to make a stand and say, look, what you did there was wrong. It's, it's, I can understand where you're coming from. You don't want to snitch on someone. But equally, when are we going to stop doing this? There are young children dying almost every day. We, we don't live in a, in a country where there's a civil war, do we? So someone has to stand up and say, this isn't the way to do it. We've got to make a stand and we've got to stop this. And it, I can't do it. It has to come from you guys. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that the joint enterprise is convicting innocent people? Yeah, yes, yeah. definitely. Some yeah. Cases, 110%. 110%? 110%. 110%. Definitely. Definitely. For real? We know the joint enterprise will exist. It's not perfect because it's very clear that the innocent can be taken down with the guilty quite easily. But at the moment, there's high crime, there's areas where things are happening, and we know what the police is going to do. They're only interested in one thing getting you, taking you down, having you inside, <laughs> and taxpayers' money paying for you whilst you're inside. Money's been made, millions have been made. Yeah. yeah. And you not see none of it. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah, people. Much, Listen, David. You guys go get your pieces and food. It's all up there. Alex Henry's trial is into its third week, and it's his turn to take the stand and give his evidence. 
Alex will be um, very nervous this morning. I'm That's nervous. Well, yeah, it's going to be all right. Turn left, Townfield Way. Hopefully it'll be over by Friday. And then we've just got the horrible wait. That's going to be horrendous. Yeah. I hope he doesn't faint when he's on the stand. He's fainted before, hasn't he, Charlotte? It's horrible. Sometimes you hear them screaming going down to the cells, don't you? What, yelling and stuff? Yeah. yeah. That must be if they get a bad sentence or something. The other day was someone making a real noise. Alex spends two days in the witness box. On the second day, he's cross-examined by the prosecution. Sometimes it's said, well, how does a defendant prove he didn't know the person had a knife? And of course, that is exceptionally difficult. I think everybody should understand that uh, proving lack of knowledge is not altogether easy for a young man in the witness box at the Old Bailey. So how do you think he did on the witness stand? He did really good, really good. His evidence that he gave was flawless. It was just everything that had been said in his original statement. And everything he says is then also said by these other co-defendants. They all say the exact same story, considering they've never been allowed to speak together. They've been in separate prisons, they've been in separate cells. They're not allowed to talk to each other can't come up with stories that that perfect and have them as lies. Yeah, so it couldn't have gone better really. <laughs> in June 2011, the jury reached their verdicts in the trial of those accused of Nicholas Pearton's murder. Seven teenage killers were sentenced to a total of 74 years in jail today for the murder of a 16-year-old in broad daylight. What the youths of today need to understand, that small minority that do carry knives are actually in a group with knives. It isn't the one that delivers the fatal blow, that will suffer consequences and punishment at court. It'll be also those that are actually are with him as well. Seven boys were found guilty of homicide offences four for manslaughter and three for murder. Dale Green was the stabber and Lamar Gordon, who was alongside him in the chase, was held to be the gang leader. CCTV footage showed the two of them shaking hands shortly after the stabbing. The third boy convicted of murder was 15-year-old Joseph J. My client Joseph was at the opposite end of the park when the stabbing happened. And we showed that because there was a 999 call at the time from a witness who was quite clear in her description of a boy's sunglasses. My client was wearing sunglasses because he has an eye condition. You can't beat hard evidence, which is the timing of the call to when Joseph exits the park, the CCTV real time, and if you collect all that together, it works out that Joseph was 220 metres away whilst Lamar Gordon Del Green had exited the park 30 seconds later, as Joseph comes out of the park, Nicholas Pearson was already dead. So what was the prosecution case against him? The, the prosecution relied on the fact that Joseph's DNA was on a knife that had been found afterwards. Joseph accepted that he had picked up two knives in the park after they'd been discarded by the other group. Now, you might think that that sounds quite ludicrous, but but the prosecution witnesses describe the other group discarding weapons in the park. Although neither of the knives that Joseph picked up was the murder weapon, this was enough to show he knew that knives were present. It was then up to the jury to decide whether he foresaw that they might be used by someone else to cause serious harm. The use of joint enterprise, in theory, doesn't dilute the usual principles of the prosecution having to prove their case and having to make the jury sure. But what it does is it places an enormous burden on a jury to read the minds of defendants who are themselves required to read the minds of other defendants. And I think that's a, a burden that probably they shouldn't have to carry. 
of course, we are told anything can happen. Jury can deliver any any verdict. No guarantee. Not anything. Not hundred percent. But we still believed because he didn't have an intention to harm anyone. He should be okay. So I still remember at the moment that one of the jury stood up and delivered the verdict to my son. I never forget it. I never forget it. That moment, everything changed. The jury found Joseph guilty of murder, while concluding that the boy who fly kicked the door moments after the attack was not guilty of the same charge. He was convicted of the lesser offence of manslaughter. I can only think that the jury concluded he had a lesser degree of knowledge of the knife than the other boy, who had a knife himself. Because of his age, Joseph's life sentence had a reduced minimum tariff, but it will still be 12 years before he can apply for parole. Such an intelligent boy, um, you know, he he's spending um, effectively. He won't be released at the earliest. Won't be released until he's until he's 30. He was a 15-year-old boy at the time with great prospects. Hands down, he's guilty of violent disorder, but he's certainly not guilty of murder. He wasn't to know Dale Green was going to do what he did. And that, where's the foresight? I mean, you can't foresee that at all. So I think it's a rather unfair, and, uh, and you know, this case is, um, has been kind of troubling me for some years now. I think the public generally feel that you should be found guilty in a criminal court for what you've done, or encouraged, or participated in. And this is such stretched participation across the extent of this park that day that he serves a life for murder at the same time as the boy who chased down the road and stabbed him. In the final week of Alex Henry's trial, the prosecution sum up their case against him. How did you feel watching that? Angry, really angry. Um, yeah, they, things that have already been disproved in court um, are now being presented as facts to the jury again, even though they've been disproved. Um, for example, now they're, they're uh, alluding to the fact that despite the, there has been a confession by one of the boys as to being the primary, the, the stabber, um, they're now trying to place my brother as, as another stabber, um, primarily the killer. Um, even though that the top he was found in didn't have any of the victim's blood on it, the boy that's confessed had an item which had the victim's blood on it. The witnesses have said that the boy that's confessed was the one that committed the stabbing. But you're certainly not going to say that you're guilty of murder and GBH with intent unless you were the stabber on those two occasions where one person died and the other person was injured. They're trying to say he wasn't, he didn't do it, he was just saying he was party to the group, that's why he pleaded guilty and someone else did it and they're trying to say it was my son. Well over my dead body are they going to get away with that and I will fight and I will carry on fighting for him. I studied law at Brunel University, so during one of the criminal modules we touched um, a little bit about joint enterprise, so I knew vaguely um, the situations that can arise from it, however I never knew it would, it would be like they would cast the net this wide to get every single person that was present there charged with murder, that, that's not what I learned. We were taught about proportionality, the intention to kill, um, the mens rea element, and I just think it's, there's none, none of that is in this case or in the previous cases where people have actually been convicted of it. Um, so I never realised it was like this. The Court of Appeal's decision on Wayne Collins' application for a reduction in sentence is due today. Just having... Just the waiting is just so... It reminds me of the trial. 
and the jury went out and they mine's the last person to for a decision to be made. So we was all on edge. And it was like half the family were like, oh my god, it's great. Here we go. Hello, you're through to Deborah. Hi Barry, how are you doing? What's the news? They've not reduced his sentence at all. They're not reducing it. I'm really, really angry. So we have to go to the European Court of Human Rights. I can't believe it. Mine's going to be devastated. And the Court of Appeal said, well, not only did his presence encourage what went on, but by the jury's verdicts, he intended to do that. Um, and so it was participation in extremely serious offending, is what the Court of Appeal said, and, and, and uh, upheld the 18 years. Hi, Mum, it's me. Oh, God. They're not letting him... and They're not granting his appeal. I know. There's, there's, we have to go. We're going to go to the, the Court of Human Rights. Jesus Christ, have mercy, let Paul win. I will be strong. But I don't know how Wayne would ever have been able to give evidence well because I don't think he's that sort of person. And the prosecution has spent weeks going through it all, looking at every little bit, how we can catch you out. Oh, you said here that, you, that it happened at five past three, and now you think it's ten past three, and how can you be so wrong? And, you know, and it's kind of, it's a game for, for, for those people who are not caught up in it. For those people who are caught up in it, it's their life. And, but, but for the others, it, it, it's, it's a game they play. The jury have retired and Sally and Charlotte are visiting Alex at Belmarsh Prison for the last time before hearing the verdict. I hate seeing him in there. He's got such... He's, he's got bags, he's, he's, he looks pale, he hasn't seen been out in, in the fresh air, he hasn't had sunlight. He just looks really, really scared and down. There's so many different groups of boys all up for joint enterprise murder. So he speaks to them and he sees them explaining that there's no evidence against them and that they've been told that they're going to be off and they're getting really excited about going home. But then he sees them a day later and they've been found guilty. So now he's terrified. We have, I'm sure, young men now in prison for a minimum of 30 years for some criminal activity where there was no intent to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. And I think it's a very serious problem. We're not saying they're not guilty of anything. It's just whether we really need to go to murder, particularly when we have such hugely long minimum terms. I feel that I'm a victim of gen enterprise as I've been convicted of a charge just for associating with someone. I do not avoid the fact that my behaviour on the horrific day of the murder was disorderly. Being a 15 year old boy following the crowd to gain a bit of respect from the older lads, I was naive to how things could end up. I had never believed that anybody would be hurt as a result of setting out that day, let alone killed. What most people forget is that a large quantity of people who didn't carry out the fatal blow are also punished for another's actions. He's still struggling to, to accept the fact. He was convicted. So as a mother, if I think about how he feels, I'm very, very sad, but I realize the things I can do is very limited. After four days of deliberations, the jury have arrived at their verdicts. Yunus Tahib, who had tried to break up the fight, is acquitted of the murder of Taki Kaziki. 
Alex Henry and his friend Janelle Grant Murray have been found guilty alongside the self-confessed stabber Cameron Ferguson. Everyone was in a real state by the time we went in. The judge tells you that when the verdict is announced, that the people in the gallery, that's us, have to take it without a noise, an absolute silence, we have to remain. Um, and so we didn't, because obviously it was such a shock. An ambulance had to be called for one of the mums. Um, I'm still just absolutely baffled as to how um, a jury could come to a majority verdict of guilty um, when there was no direct evidence in this case. Um, just for hanging out with the wrong friend, I suppose. That's it. So just being there, there's, there's nothing he could have done to, no. to change it. He couldn't have foresaw that anything would was going to happen that day. He was just a young boy going shopping with some friends. Charlotte went up to the um, relative of the victim. Give us the father. Father of the victim and said, I'm sorry for your loss. And he said, I'm sorry for yours. You're very courageous saying that to him. Well, there's no winners in this, is there? That's for sure. No. So this is the road Ben was murdered in, North Road. And after his murder, all the kids went to lay flowers and they all signed the street sign. You know, even the kids around here, locally as a community, they had enough. There was a big march organised by young kids saying enough is enough of this knife crime and violent crime on our streets. But our son never got to find out about his exam results. We was given an envelope for that sort of two months after he died to say that he was a straight A student. Um, you know, we never see him grow up. And they can go and visit their um, sons or daughters. We have to go up to a cemetery every weekend or nearly every weekend. You know, that's what you've got to think about. He was precious to us. And I feel to them life's cheap. He was our everything, wasn't he? Yep. Yeah. Following Ben's death, the Kinsella family successfully campaigned to increase the mandatory sentence for murder with a knife from 15 to 25 years. The laws are there to sort of keep people on the straight and never, but if people want to break them, then they've got to face the consequences of that. They've, they've got to know that if they're going to get involved in serious crimes like murder and stuff, then being part of it, you, you, are, you might as well throw away the key yourself. Sentencing for Alex Henry and his co-defendants is at Snaresbrook Crown Court. Cameron Ferguson receives a life sentence with a minimum term of 22 years. As secondary parties, Alex and Janelle Grant Murray are given life with minimum terms of 19 years, despite there being no proof that either had a knife or intended to kill or cause serious harm. What, what, what was his face like? Because I was discomforting you and... I was trying he, to see. he seemed okay, just he looked straight ahead. He seemed dignified. He, he did. He just looked straight ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a very harsh sentence. I think um, Cameron Ferguson's actions on that day um, did tragically take Taki's life. Um, left the family devastated and mother heartbroken. But this law has also taken two more victims 
my brother and his friend Janelle are now going to be serving a life sentence for a murder they did not com commit. And two more families are now devastated, and two more mothers are now heartbroken. And something needs to change. Alex and Janelle's lawyers are appealing against their convictions. It's difficult to appeal convictions generally. The reason's a good one, actually, which is that the, the Court of Appeal respects the jury's verdict, and unless something's gone seriously wrong in the trial process, they will uphold that verdict. They may not agree with it, but if they think that the jury were given all the relevant facts and the trial was conducted fairly and according to the law, then, generally speaking, that, that's enough for the verdict to, to stand, even if it's one that people don't think is correct. The appeal process has left the Collins family deeply disillusioned. We just thought, even if he got four years taken off, we would have been happy. But for it to just completely be dismissed, oh, we were just... It was devastating. It was like him being resentenced all over again. Yeah. On the run-up to the appeal, it, it gave him hope, didn't it? Like, they, they something to look forward up, yeah. to, but there's nothing now. Unfortunately, the demographic group who are affected by joint enterprise are going to be a section of society who do not have a great deal of influence. And I don't see middle class people ending up in the dock being accused of crimes on the basis that they associate or they're with other people who commit crimes. Calls for reform are coming not only from families caught up in joint enterprise cases, but also from the Law Commission and the Justice Committee of the House of Commons. So far, successive governments have declined to act. And I think there's an element of policy here. The law has progressed in this way to cater for large numbers of senseless killings, when if you didn't have a definition such as exists at the moment, very often the followers, the encouragers, would be acquitted of any responsibility for the death. My suggested reform would be that a person is only guilty of murder if he intended to kill or intended to cause grievous bodily harm. No intention, no guilt. No intention, no guilt. I'd like the people that want this reform to talk to parents like us, parents that and family that have lost their loved ones, um, talk to us and see if that changes your mind. Um, you know, I'm sure if, if, if the boot was on the other foot, they'd feel exactly as strongly as us. Joint Enterprise is a court full of lies. Joint Enterprise is a court full of lies. Let our prisoners go. Let our prisoners go. Not guilty by association. Not guilty by association. The judges in the Supreme Court tomorrow could say, this doctrine has led us too far away from basic principles and we should abandon this. So it could be done. I'm not saying it would be done, but it could be done. Are you saying it should be done? If, in my view, it should be done. <laughs>